Hi, everyone. Thanks, Brent, for the intro. I'm Pratyush, and uh, here to present our work on decentralized anonymous micropayments. As Brent said, this is joint work with my advisor, Alessandro, <coughs> Matt, Jingcheng, Pehan, and Ian. OK. So digital payments are a solved problem, right? The customer sends along some money to the merchant. The merchant keeps some amount for themselves, sends along a tiny bit to the payment network, and everybody's happy. But this model breaks down when the transaction amount is much smaller than the transaction fee itself. Supporting such small payments is important uh, for a lot of applications, however. For example, consider that um, when I visit a web page, I don't want any ads, so I give the website owner some money and get back an uh, ad-free web page. Since most ad impressions and clicks are worth fractions of a cent, what I want to pay is fractions of a cent, but since transaction fees are often on the order of tens of cents, this doesn't make any sense. There's a rich history in cryptography of constructing such micropayment schemes, and lots of esteemed names have worked on this problem, but we still don't have any widespread deployments that involve multiple merchants and uh, many, many customers. I think a potential reason for this is that all these prior schemes, they require a central mediator to uh, instantiate the micropayments. <clears throat> and this is an issue because now your customer and merchant uh, need to have complex financial relations with this middleman, and they have to meet regulations, and many other reasons. So let's look at what's happening in the decentralized world. Here, the cryptocurrency Bitcoin has seen widespread adoption across the globe. And I think one reason for this is that to transfer money to somebody, I don't need to even have met them before. I, I don't need to establish relations with them, don't have to meet any regulations. I just sign a message and put it on some global ledger. In more detail, let's say Alice wants to send to Bob, say, $4.3. All she does is sign this message from A to B, amount 4.3, and uh, put the message and the signature on a global ledger that's maintained by the nodes in the Bitcoin network. So can we use Bitcoin for micropayments directly? And the answer is not quite, because you run into a few problems. The first is that even though Bitcoin is decentralized and there's no actual middleman taking a cut, <clears throat> you still suffer from the issue of high transaction fees. And these are roughly on the order of credit card network transaction fees today. And it's projected that as Bitcoin tries to scale, these fees will only get higher. The second issue is that each transaction takes a long time to confirm in Bitcoin on the order of 10 minutes, and uh, the recommendation is actually to wait uh, more like an hour uh, for your transaction to be confirmed. This is particularly bad for micropayment applications because nobody wants to wait an hour for their web page to load. A third issue is uh, from like a privacy perspective, where the issue is that Bitcoin doesn't offer any strong anonymity guarantees. In particular, the sender, receiver, and transaction amount are all public for every transaction. This has two consequences. The first is that you don't have fungibility, and this has nothing to do with mushrooms, but just means that um, even if I have two coins of the same denomination, they might not be treated equally depending on their transaction history. The second or more obvious issue is that of privacy, and this is particularly bad for micropayment applications. For instance, you don't want your browser history to be available for everybody in the world to see on this global ledger. So two separate works have dealt with uh, these two classes of problems. The first is a work by Pastin Shalat at uh, CCS a couple of years ago. And they use a technique of probabilistic payments, which we'll dive into later, to implement micropayments for Bitcoin. These, uh, this technique solves both the first two problems by amortizing the transaction fee and confirmation time across uh, many payments which don't hit the ledger. Uh, to solve the problem of anonymity, Zero Cash was proposed at um, Oakland roughly three years ago. And this is an anonymous Bitcoin-like currency which hides uh, all information about the sender, receiver, and uh, transaction amount for every transaction. So the ledger looks opaque to um, some outside observer. OK. So <clears throat> what we want in some sense is micropayments that combine uh, these two worlds. In more detail, we want micropayments that are decentralized for the ease of deployment property anonymous for fungibility and privacy reasons, and finally offline for the fast response that is useful for micropayment applications. What we achieve is a definition of a crypto primitive uh, that has these properties via, via the idle functionality. 
a construction for this uh, definition under standard cryptographic assumptions like NISX and commitment schemes. And to realize this construction, we use two primary tools. The first is a fractional message transfer protocol, which is in some sense an analog of OT specialized to our setting. Prior constructions of FMT schemes um, were bundled under this umbrella called translucent crypto. And as we'll see later, in our setting, we can't uh, prevent all double spending cryptographically, so we have to rely on the rationality of um, the agents in the system. And so we provide a tight characterization of double spending. Okay. <clears throat> so the main building block of both our construction and the Pass and Shalat uh, paper is that of probabilistic payments. In this model, when Alice wants to pay Bob a cent, she doesn't give him a cent for every transaction, but what she does is she takes a dollar and then interacts with Bob in such a way that most of the time she gets to keep the dollar and no transaction occurs, so she doesn't have to talk to the uh, ledger or payment network. And we call this a null payment. But like one out of every hundred trials, <clears throat> Bob gets a dollar. So a transaction occurs either via the ledger or some payment network, and we call this a micropayment. Why do probabilistic payments lead to micropayments? The idea is that these 99 null payments, they amortize uh, the transaction fee and the cost of using the payment network. So your transaction fee and uh, your confirmation time are both amortized over your 99 null payments. Okay. <clears throat> so let's dive in, in a bit more to see how Pass and Shalat use uh, uh, implement probabilistic payments over Bitcoin. The key idea is to take a coin flipping protocol and combine that with Bitcoin in some way. In more detail, <clears throat> when Alice and Bob want to transact, what Alice does is she escrows some uh, value V on the ledger. They engage in a coin flipping protocol. If Alice wins, she gets to reuse the escrow for further uh, trials of this, uh, further executions of this protocol. But, uh, but if Bob wins, it's a macro payment, and he gets to redeem the value and keep it for himself. The key thing to note here is that um, Alice escrows the value only once, and she gets to reuse this escrow again and again until a macro payment occurs and Bob redeems it. So this is where the amortization property comes from. Okay, zero cash is a bit more uh, involved, but at the high level, the idea is to use zero knowledge proofs um, and combine them with Bitcoin to hide uh, information about transactions. In more detail, now the zero cash ledger consists not of messages and signatures, but serial numbers of spent coins, commitments to new coins, and zero knowledge proofs that link the two. So let's say Alice owns a coin C1 that she received in some past transaction. Its commitment appears on the ledger, as you can see, CM1. And she wants to transfer the value in this coin to Bob. What she does is she takes her secret key and combines it with the coin to generate the serial number for C1. Next, she takes Bob's public key and uses that to derive a commitment for a new coin, C3, and corresponding commitment, CM3. Finally, she creates a zero-knowledge proof that asserts that the first two steps are performed correctly and that um, the value in the input and output is maintained. They're not having arbitrary inflation. Okay. She publishes um, a transaction consisting of the old serial number, the new coin's commitment, and the proof to the ledger. The reason why this gives any security is that only Alice can derive the serial number for her coin. Uh, anybody else looking at the ledger can't link CM1 with SN1 because they don't have Alice's secret key. Similarly, that's the reason why Alice can't spend Bob's coin that she creates for him uh, because she doesn't know his secret key and therefore can't generate his serial number. Okay. So the naive idea would be to just take the pass and last protocol and replace um, Bitcoin with zero cash. So now Alice escrows her value not in a Bitcoin transaction, but in a zero cash transaction. They engage in the coin flip as before. If Alice wins, she keeps the escrow. But if Bob wins, he gets to redeem it. This doesn't work for two, uh, for two reasons. Uh, you don't have anonymity, and the customer can double spend. So let's dive into each issue. <clears throat> In the first case, uh, 
what we see is that when Alice, uh, she, since she wants to amortize the transaction fees, she has to reuse the escrow every time. But Bob wants to be convinced that whenever Alice is transacting with him, she's using a valid escrow. So he needs to learn, in some sense, the serial number of the escrow coin. <clears throat> but this creates an issue because, let's say, Alice transacts with Bob. It's a null payment, but Bob still learns the serial number of the coin. Next, she goes to, say, some other merchant. Carol interacts with her, and this time it's a macro payment. So Carol gets the serial number and is able to append the transaction to the ledger. Bob now sees the ledger and sees, oh, a coin that somebody tried to use with me has now been spent. This, so the, Alice doesn't have uh, the strong guarantee of anonymity that we had in zero cash. There are other attacks which lead to even further loss of privacy, so this, this um, naive idea doesn't quite work. What we do to solve this is to make the serial number translucent. So what this means is that now Alice, instead of creating a transaction and appending it to the ledger, just commits to it and sends along the commitment and the proof that the commitment was formed correctly and the transaction inside is valid at the time of creation. Then they engage in some probabilistic opening protocol that opens the commitment only with some fixed probability. What we want is that with probability 1 minus p, the commitment remains completely hidden to Bob, but with probability p, he's able to open it and get out the transaction and redeem it. To achieve this, we create this fractional message transfer protocol, which has two properties, fractional hiding, and shows that uh, with probability 1 minus p, um, Bob learns nothing about what's inside the message, and fractional binding ensures that Alice cannot bias the probability that the commitment is opened. It always has to be P. So in some sense, what Alice wants is exactly fractional hiding, and what Bob wants is, exact, is exactly fractional binding. Okay, we realize the construction of this on using under the assumption of DDH and in the random oracle model. Okay, so that solves the issue of like, malicious merchants that want to de-anonymize customers. But what about malicious cus uh, customers? So let's say we have a malicious Alice, and the attack that she can perform is she can use the same coin with multiple merchants at the same time. So let's say she's transacting with these four merchants, and two of them became mic uh, macro payments. Let's say Carol gets her transaction onto the ledger first, and Bob, being a bit slow, uh, loses out. So now Bob doesn't have, can't redeem the transaction, the macro payment, and Alice has gained utility at his expense. In our setting, there's no way to prevent this double spending attack cryptographically because there's no global immediate consensus among uh, the merchants about what is and isn't a valid uh, payment at any given time. Consensus only comes along at these 10-minute blocks in Bitcoin. Whereas here, we want this immediate confirmation, so we can't wait for these 10 minutes. So to solve this, we disincentivize customers from cheating by having them uh, penalized if they cheat. The idea is that now before any transactions, Alice creates a separate deposit coin, and this is put on the ledger. And when she wants to interact with Bob, what she does is commits not only to the transaction as before, but also a secret share of the deposit's serial number. Um, the proof now also proves that the secret share is formed correctly and, and the deposit is valid at the time of the transaction. They do the probabilistic opening as before, and if Bob is able to open the commitment, he gets the transaction and also the secret share, and he posts both of these to the ledger. Why does this help us? And the idea is pretty simple. Let's say Alice is transacting with Bob. It's a macro payment. He gets the transaction and the secret share, and he posts it to the ledger. Let's say now that Alice cheats, and she's interacting with either Bob or perhaps with another merchant, and becomes a macro payment again. This other merchant uh, now gets a different secret share of the serial number and is able to recover the, uh, of the, the, um, recover the serial number and append it to the ledger. At this point, Alice's deposit is revoked, and she has some negative utility. Okay. So, so far, we've used probabilistic opening and deposits to prevent linkability and uh, double spending. So, uh, uh, but are we done? 
And the answer is not quite. We're still lacking in terms of both functionality and a security analysis. What happens when the customer, they're saying, OK, I'm done with the system. I want to leave it. Can they withdraw the deposit? Ideally, you want them to be able to, uh, to withdraw the deposit, because otherwise, the deposit money is some sunk cost for them, and they're incentivized to constantly keep cheating to recover as much as they can. But if you allow them to recover the deposit, what they can do is withdraw it just before the deposit is revoked. And uh, this is clearly an issue because it's defeated the entire purpose of asking. We run into similar issues when dealing with merchant aborts, and they try to frame the customer for double spending. Um, there's some similar issues arise. So this is from a functionality perspective. But we haven't even talked about um, what the value of the deposit should be. If it's unbounded, then again, our system is completely unusable because nobody will sign up to do, uh, to, for this micropayment micro scheme. So we solve both of these issues. Um, we extend zero cash uh, with some extra features to allow this, uh, this uh, withdrawal deposit feature. And we provide a tight economic analysis of how much um, a customer can gain by double spending. And the, the main idea is that basically the deposit value has to be equal to the financial activity that you want to conduct in the system. OK. So to conclude, um, the key idea from our paper is that we used this translucent crypto plus game theory to construct decentralized anonymous micropayments. Our game theoretic analysis is applicable not only to our setting, but also um, to others. For example, uh, the Parsons Lab paper, they, ha they had the idea of deposits, but they didn't specify what the value should be. It's also applicable to probabilistic smart contracts and applications suggested by Parsons Lab. And finally, um, as I said before, we extended the interface of zero cash to be more expressive and programmable. And we're already able to use this uh, added programmability in some new applications that we're working on right now. Thank you. Any questions? So could you prove from a game theoretical point of view that the best strategy is to be honest? Yeah, I think so in our, in our case. It, the idea is that when you double spend, you lose all your money, whatever money that you could have gained from double spending. So it, make, it makes no sense to double spend. So what are the uh, pros and cons versus uh, payment channels such as Lightning Network? So I think in payment channels, you're limited to uh, specifically the merchants that are in your network, right? Uh, and also, I think there was this paper, Bolt, uh, by Ian and Matt, that constructed uh, these anonymous payment channels, and they had not the perfect anonymity that we gain. In, in our setting, uh, there's basically no link between micro, even these null payments, between two much uh, consecutive null payments between the same customer and the same merchant. Um, yeah, so I think uh, uh, the paper has a uh, comparison with payment channels, and I think we have stronger uh, anonymity guarantees. I think there's a question here as well. So how do you prevent uh, the user from giving the same secret share to all the merchants? So we have a way to derive the secret share using um, some, like, the public key of the... Uh, some it's like a, we have a way to make it unique to uh, per merchant and per instance of the protocol too. And still, uh, two shares would be uh, enough to recover. Yeah. There's a question here as well. You derive a share from the public key and the. Uh, and some per per instance uh, specific randomness. I have a question. Can you tell me if I understand your solution correctly? And I think that the, the payment channel used in Lightning Network is the kind of a one-to-one <coughs> -one channel. Uh, I think your solution, once the deposit is done, I think it's a one-to-all. Yeah, you can use the deposit once, and then you can transact with however many merchants that deposit value supports. So it's not limited to, say, 10 merchants. You can do uh, like a specific set of 10 merchants. You can transact with any set of 10 merchants. And another yeah. question is that, uh, do you think this probability payment is uh, realistic in 
real applications because <laughs> it's probabilistic. Well, the entire protocol is like not very practical at the moment, but um, I think, I mean, I, I don't think there's been deployments of probabilistic payments before directly, but I think if you adjust it for certain applications, it might be useful. 